Hi, it's Tom Anderson at Connecticut Audubon. How are you? Good, Tom. How are you today? I'm, I'm good. I'm good. So uh, um, just so everybody knows, uh, this is Lisa Wally. Tell us your, your title or a description that, that will let us know what you're an expert in. I'm actually a contract biologist. I work with the department and I've been the habitat biologist on the New England Cottontail Project for about 10 years now. Explain to us, there are New England cottontails and there are Eastern cottontails. Both live in Connecticut and New England. What, t tell us about each and what are the differences? I actually, I, I'm gonna show you in a, in a, in oh. a couple of pictures in a, okay. in, a, in a couple of minutes, but basically the New England is our native cottontail um, that, that have, has been on the landscape here, evolved on this landscape in New England. And the Eastern cottontail is a very similar rabbit, cottontail rabbit, that was imported by not a couple dozen, but by the tens of thousands, starting in the late 1800s and into the beginning of the 1900s, to bolster hunting activities largely. So they were imported by fish and game agencies and clubs um, brought, brought on the landscape. And they happen to be a very successful rabbit. They live very well in our fragmented landscape. But and they were imported from where? They were, well, and I got I can show you that too, but their range is quite extensive. It goes from Canada to Central America and throughout the Midwest, they came from all different states. So what we ended up with is kind of this hybrid animal here that, that has come from many, many of the states in the Midwest. You want to show us your pictures, sure. your slides? Sure. We'll actually work through the Wildlife Management Institute, who is very instrumental in putting boots on the ground for projects like this. Mm -hmm. So that's that's how I, I work with the department, just to, to give them full credit. Sure. Um, here's it to answer your question. Here is the range of Eastern cottontails that now includes New England's, but they weren't, they weren't um, normally native to New England. They weren't here until they were introduced. But the range goes from Canada through Central America. And they, as I said, they were introduced to, the, to our New England, where the historic range of New England's was below this black line here. That's what we have from the middle of the last century. Now, New England cottontails are really concentrated where those red circles are in, in their range here. So that, and, and to talk a little bit about how we tell them apart, it's really, really hard to do this in the field, especially from a distance. You can, I mean, our, our, our folks who, who handle these animals all the time, they've gotten really good at it. And, and they, they can, even when these, these field markings are absent or cryptic, but basically, if you see an, an animal, a, a cottontail, in your yard or in the wild, which you're, it, it, it's rare that you do that anyway, and it has any kind of a white spot on its forehead, it's the other rabbit. It's the introduced eastern. Um, the black spot is much more cryptic on, on a New England. The eastern cotton tail is a bigger animal. Its ears are bigger. That's one of the clues if you're, especially if you're handling them. Mm. And its eyes are bigger and it's generally a bigger, bigger animal. But basically the way that we, we, we still take tissue samples. For instance, if we're, we're trapping animals that go to the zoo breeding program, we still take a tissue sample to confirm their genetics that they are in fact full bred um, New Englands. We don't, we don't want to be breeding Easterns. And, and most of the time, the way we figure out where we have these animals on the landscape is we collect poop and we do the DNA, DNA analysis. So that's the, basically the, the difference between those, those two in the field. Um, we get pictures of people send us pictures all the time saying, what do you think this is? Uh -huh. um, you can often tell by those years. Very interesting. There, there are not, um... There are not a lot of examples of different species that are almost identical in the field. A few in Connecticut, fish crows and common crows, unless you hear them, it's, it's, you can't really tell the difference. A um, couple of the flycatchers, willow flycatcher and alder flycatcher, right. you can't tell from looking at them. But it's, it's fairly unusual, I think, that, that this kind of thing happens. Yeah, yeah, and I think that's a really good analogy of, um, of how difficult it is to tell these two. They are the same genus. And um, even though they have a different number of chromosomes, they're, 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 they're closely related animals. 
um, here on, on this photo. One of the, the interesting things that, that was found out is that this bigger eye surface really in the, in the Eastern Cottontail may give this animal a competitive advantage over our New Englands is that they're, they're, they're better at detecting predators mm -hmm. that, that um, in some work that was, was done up in New Hampshire, they found that New Englands were disproportionately picked off by predators compared to Eastern and they can attribute that to the, to the, to the eye size. Interesting, interesting. Why don't you just take it from here and I'll okay. interject but, uh, but I guess we maybe, I'm not sure what, what order your slides are in, but we probably should start with um, talking about what the overall project is that you're involved in to, to um, try to identify where there are and increase their habit. If Habitat, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you had asked me that to, to talk about, you know, what like 20 years of, of conservation and, and, and what have we been doing and how has that come about? I, 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 I hope, and, and again, it, you, can, you can direct me else, you know, as, as you see fit as I go along, but I tried to put some history together here okay. on the conservation effort. Um, and here it is, in the last 20 years when this has really come to the fore is what happened was fish and wildlife was was petitioned to list these species under the endangered protect them under the endangered species act but the fact that they were petitioned to do so tells you that there was a body of research and and evidence that that um made them be an, a, a a species of concern um what fish and wildlife said is we will list them as a candidate we will we will we we've given them a designation as a candidate after some some court court orders um and and they said in 2006 they did that they listed them as a candidate they said in 2014 we will, will make a decision whether they need to be listed or not so what that time frame allowed was for the states and the federal um, agencies to and the, the different universities and zoos to get together and form a collaborative effort of conservation and start doing research that they could present to Fish and Wildlife in 2014 for them to make their decision. And as 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 as, as you, you you probably know, in 2015, the Fish and Wildlife Service says we feel that listing these species under the Endangered Species Act is not warranted due to the demonstrated success of this conservation effort. And this is the most important piece and the expectation that this was going to continue. So that's, you know, in a nutshell, what's been going on for the last 20 years is we've been working collaboratively to try to, to keep this, this animal, from, animal from becoming threatened or endangered. The New England cottontail is a, is a poster child for young forest species at risk, along with American woodcock. But really, this habitat supports a lot of species that are of conservation need and in decline and largely determine that that, that habitat is, is, the, is the main factor there. Interrupt me anytime if you want to. Yeah, no, this is, this is fascinating. And it's, it's just, it, this, this eliminates Three or four of my questions right here. Okay, keep, keep I, yeah, on. I tried to, I try, I tried to address. Okay, good. Yeah, this is so, great. So, um, the 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 other thing that I, you, is important to understand is that the decline of young forest and shrubland species has been on the radar of managers and conservationists for a long time. I mean, breeding bird surveys started, started to show a decline in in some of these species that rely on young forest and shrubland into you know in the last century and this graphic could be repeated for prairie warblers and field um field sparrows and um, um chestnut-sided warblers and a number of the um indigo buntings a number of these species that rely on this habitat so it's it was on the radar but it was really this is the when this, this listing possibility for, for the bunny came along, that's what really got the, the, the action going on, on the plight of young forest species. Out of, out of the box, um, it was determined that, um, that, 
that habitat was the the key factor the uh, in in loss of 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 the, the, the decline of the species was due to a decline in habitat in its quantity, quality, and connectivity. I think we're seeing these days is that the quantity issue might not be as much an issue as this, as how well these patches are, are um, connected on the landscape and what quality, and are, and are they in the right place? Um, of course, as with a lot of wildlife habitat, we've lost a lot of it to development We've also, in, in the case of young forest species, we often lose them to natural succession, often lose, lose these patches to natural succession. They just become, you know, from a place where, where bunnies can hide and find food to a place where they can't as, as forests mature. We've also had some other, uh, this is a, 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 an area where we've always depended on as a managed shrubland um, is that these power line corridors are now being heavily impacted by upgrades that are going on along these corridors that involve large amounts of, of, of graveling and also a, a more aggressive um, approach to managing these areas that involves a lot more, more broad scale mowing. And it, we've, we've been working with Eversource to, 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 to try to pull back on this where in critical areas mm -hmm. um, and, and minimize the impact. But it's still, it's, you can't not have an impact when you've got to put gravel pads on the grounds. And, and the reason why, why we came to Audubon to ask them to do a project, um, Connecticut Audubon and, and other agencies, is that New England cottontails can't live under a rose bush in your backyard. They need these large patches of habitat for a viable local population. And basically it's, there, there are a couple of forms of this. One is we have old fields that are reverting. And this is, this is one down in Stonington. It's a terrible invasive mess, but it happens to hold New England's, a population of New England's in, in there. And then the management that, that we do or that is done by, by forestry for other reasons is we, we, we set back the succession clock on a patch of forest. To, 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 to create that habitat. And this is ephemeral. I mean, this, this will be beneficial between, in regeneration between, let's say, year four and year 20, and that'll start to age out. And just to, to highlight that, this is um, since the middle of the last century, um, we've not lost, we are still a heavily forested state, which we're fortunate to be, even though we're very populous. But the amount of young forest on the landscape has really declined over that time. And that's what we're trying to restore when we do these forest management projects. And some, I not, won't go through all of these, but these are some of the natural natural forces on the landscape and man-made, the, the, um, the farmland and re reverting charcoal lands gave us some, some young forest on the landscape. Um, but but be, even before people were here or, or people were doing large scale management, fires were allowed to burn, beavers would create, a, there was a time when there were more beavers on our landscape than people and large areas were flooded. There was a coastal shrubland. And I don't know if you had a chance to visit along and probably some, some remnants down at, down at um, the Milford Point and Stratford area. There's this dense thicket of of green briar and and um, poison ivy bushes and and um, and bayberry that formed a coastal thicket and that's so spotty now we have so little little of that left. Um, our, we've lost most of our pitch pine scrub oak areas and and um, and floodplain areas that were scoured because we control a lot of this stuff. Um, we don't let fires burn. We don't let beavers do their work to the extent that they used to. And this is pretty much what our coastal shrubland looks like now. <laughs> we don't, we just don't have that, that, then we're probably not gonna get it back. Yeah. So we like to think of ourselves as doing the work of beavers out, out there. Hmm. So we do some forest management and that's typically, and we follow our best management practices. Um, 
when we, when we do that, we are working at a six acre minimum patch size for funding that creates enough. Um, that's really kind of minimal. It would be better to have larger patches, but the, but when we do an active active project, that's generally. Croft was great because you were able to give us so much more than that in, on the landscape because it's a 700 acre parcel and, and you had a bunch of land to work with up yeah. there. I think I think we're um, we're managing about fifteen percent of that seven hundred acres. Yeah, yeah. Which is yeah. if you go up there, you'll see how, how just how big of an area that is. I'm actually going there tomorrow. Well, oh, good. These are the areas where we manage, and I I would say about half of these are truly active, where we really have have. New England's and I'm getting, I'm, I'm winding down here to where we've got, got projects going with the Connecticut Audubon. Yeah, but do you mind if we go back to the, the previous slide? Because sure. uh, it, it, this is a great example of how um, political boundaries are meaningless. If, if you look at the big contiguous area in Western Connecticut and yep. Eastern New York, and then in Eastern yep. Connecticut and Western Rhode Island, those are, yep. those are yep. big, seem to me, from looking at the map, big significant areas. They are, they are, they're they they're, they're certainly and and I I gotta admit like I don't think New York isn't managing up here. I don't think they've found we're really when we look at where we're finding rabbits lately. This is it. Hmm. Um, I've got kind of a stark map. Our eastern Connecticut and Rhode Island is 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 a sadder story. Rhode Island for a long time still they. St Till they started reintroducing New Englands in the last few years, they've they had lost their New England population hmm. like five years ago, and and I, I'm, we're starting to see that kind of creep into Eastern Connecticut, where we had populations that were or, or areas that were co-occupied, we call them, where we had both Easterns and New Englands, that the New Englands get kind of wedged out over time. So this this is a concern. Rhode Island has begun reintroducing to certain areas where they, they, they feel that they can get them reestablished. But that was a, that was a pretty rude awakening to, to, to have them, them disappear. So again, this is an older slide of where those original focused areas were established. Um, but yes, you know, you're right. They, they, the, the, the boundaries don't, 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 don't are, are, are immaterial to these animals. And, and I think your, your, uh, your deer pond property is because because we'll get out there too and i'm sure since we found found them on the new york side we're going to find them on the, the the connecticut side right that's right deer, deer pond farm which is yeah. its, its address is sherman connecticut it's 850 acres um, yep. a big part of it is in connecticut but a big part of it is also in pauling new york and the new york state dec if i remember correctly found new england cottontails on the new york portion within the last six months yeah. or so yeah, yeah, yeah. It was actually we sample in the winter. Mm -hmm. We, you know, we go out. So it would have been last winter's okay. data, um, just to hone in on Connecticut here. And I'll I'll pull up your sanctuaries in a sec. Okay. Um, I wanted to just show a few things. These pink dots are where we have documented in the last ten years populations. Um, some of them in the eastern Connecticut we haven't been able to reestablish in the last five years, which is disturbing. But it's it's this Western Connecticut um, area that that that's hot that we feel like we you know that this is where we're 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 doing the best out here and I have another graphic to, that explains that but I did want to pull up where your sanctuaries are mm -hmm. in in the state and um and 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 where we found animals so Deer Pond as as you said is Sherman and Pauling right on that that border up up here. And I can pull up the aerial in a sec too. The Croft Preserve in Goshen, where we do seem to have a viable popu population um, it, it, in a couple of our state land um, wildlife management areas, as well as Croft. So that that's sorry. Hold on. <laughs> and then this this population that is hanging in down at your Larson Preserve, yeah, Larson Sanctuary in in Fairfield is um, that that's a, one of the, the populations that worries us a little because, because it's hemmed in sure. by development, but it's persisting. And it's, you know, we've, we've 
um, for 10 years, I think we've been documenting that population there. And just Miley, like- um, my, my, You mentioned Miley Bull before. Miley, Miley and I were out walking in the sanctuary. I think, believe this was in the fall of 2015. And it, it, the reason we were there is because he was taking me out to show me where they had been found. And he had just gotten a communication from somebody that was sort of re reconfirming in 2015 what they had found in, I think, 1969. Yeah, that's yeah. that's what if I remember correctly. So that's a that's, I mean, over the in geology geologic time, that's nothing. But in you know mo the, the the era of modern development, that the modern development, that's a fairly long time. It is, it is. Yeah, and what we've we've looked at, you've got another sanctuary down there, not far. Um, Bank South, Banks, Bank South Farm. Yes, oh. yes, Bank South. And we did collect pellets down there too this last winter to, to so we don't have the data back yet, mm. but, but, um, but we're looking and hopefully we'll find some other, we worry about these genetically isolated populations is, they, it's, is that eventually they, they do, um, they, they, it's like island biogeography. They, right. they, they, they just become extinct because they're inbred. Right. over time and don't compete well so it would be it would be nice to know that they are they're having some they're talking genetically with some other other population that's that's local I, another one that's kind of a, a poster child for genetic isolation is down here at bluff point in um, groton connecticut on our state land mm. um that's been for and and there's just there's no influx there's no there's 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 no there's no genetic talking yeah. down there. um You've you've got the 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 railroad and I ninety five. Those are those are big yes. barriers. Yes, big barriers. Yeah, and since the, you know the 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 railroad is even more hardened lately with fencing and and right. and so it, it's it's even more difficult. So so that that population may not be with us for a long time. And the, the other the I other you have, you have the Cheney Preserve in Montville on the on the map there. I do. I do, and it doesn't have any document in New England's on it, but it's really close to some. So yeah. that's our that's our hope for that one. And I just want to here's here here are aerials of those preserves. So um, I I don't have I didn't put down specifically where those bunnies were found at at the Deer Deer Pond Farm, but they're generally over in this area, in um on the New York side of that preserve, which is enormous. I mean that this is, isn't that like it, it, this preserve is, I don't forgot how many acres it's it is. 800, but it's, 800, it's a, 850 acres. 850, yeah, yeah, just a wonderful acquisition. Um, and so, but over in the Connecticut side, um, need to, to, to talk with, with your director out there mm -hmm. to, to figure out what's, what are good locations to go looking. But that's after Croft, that's the next one on the list to get out and sample on the Connecticut side of that. Um, this, I'm trying to be gentle. This pink triangles are the the documented New Englands on the Larson Sanctuary. They're back in this nasty thickety area that's that's largely covered with multiflora, but we're we're they're persisting in there. The blue dots are eastern cottontails, so we've got that's definitely a mixed population out out there. On that on that Larson aerial for people, because Larson is um, is along with. The Milford Point Coastal Center, our most popular sanctuary, the the center and the parking lot on that area would be like underneath the right below the A and the R in the word sanctuary. Yes, exactly. So you you know you're walking to the back, and this and this backs yeah backs up against big lawns. Yeah. On 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 the other side here, and from here even from this area, just just want to point out is you you can almost see there's very little understory, and it's right. not. I mean, this is a winter leaf off photo, but it, you can almost see that you're kind of looking at stems of trees, mm -hmm. and there's not much going on in the understory. So, so we can kind of from aerial photographs look to see where we're likely to find animals on the landscape, but it's in this area that's darker colored. A lot of these invasives actually have green stems and green briar does too, which makes an, an awesome habitat for these animals, but you can kind of see where it's rougher in the, in the landscape there. And that's what they like. 
Oh yeah, they need they need a thicket, and and just the, these animals are on the menu of every predator that we have in the state. So so, uh, <laughs> along with easterns, but they're but they're 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 not as good at avoiding predators, and and so they that thorny thicket cover is absolutely critical as part of the part of the the the, the component of that shrub thicket or young forest. And this is the Croft Preserve. This is where we've got our documentation. We need to get back out there because you did a big, you can see it in the, this is a, a, a an area that was recently managed. So I've got a long day ahead of me tomorrow to look through this, 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 this area. This is the, the, the access that comes in from East Street North and um, to, to move around in here and, 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 reestablish, you know, and, and I'm confident I'm going to find them because kind of across the street, um, you know, less than a kilometer away is we've got a, a documented population. So how, that, long do they, how long do they live? They in the wild couple of years. Couple of years. So yeah. if they were there in 2012, Max, Max. If, they, if they were there in 2012 and they're there now, that means they've got a, it's a breeding population. It's got to be. It's yeah. got to be. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Those aren't those the, that that animal isn't alive anymore. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that that's for sure. Yeah, yeah. Max maximum. Most don't make it through their first year. It's uh, like I said. It's they're on the menu of everybody. Sure. And that and predation is their number one cause of mortality. Right. Yeah. So and I just wanted to show you Cheney, the Cheney <laughs> Preserve over here. You can see that power line corridor in the aerial photograph. Mm -hmm. at the Cheney Preserve and that's the pink again is where we've got them documented in 2014 anyway again the blues we looked here more recently and we only came up with easterns but and on the the management area again that was done in a more traditional clearing area we've only come up with easterns but we are we are not giving up hope that they're going to show up and th these power line corridors are really the dispersal mechanism that we're 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 looking at very interesting arterials yeah. yeah so so you know so so um kudos to connecticut audubon for working with us on on this project we love to oh. have the blue wing warblers and the towhees and the indigo buntings come back as well absolutely absolutely um i won't go through all of this but these were our goals um in in the listing decision these is what in the end after our, our strategy goes out to 2030 and this is what we'd hope to have on the landscape we had intended to have on the landscape is is a, a landscape or a, a, a an area where animals can genetically talk to each other with about 2500 um individuals and five landscapes within the range that can support up to a thousand and 12 others that support 500. Very interesting. Do you have any way of estimating how large a landscape of tw that can, that can yeah. uh, support 2,500 or more animals might be? Yeah, I, well, that, those are the things we've been learning about really what densities are on the landscape with those, those um, the, the, the studies, the that have been done on the individuals to really what we're, we're looking at um, and also the extent of where we find these animals. I think our, our Cape Cod population may be the one that hits this, this larger number here. Um, I would say if you combine, I mean, if you combine the Western Connecticut um, and New York populations, we would be there depending, but, but then, you know, what we're learning too is that these animals don't disperse as, as well and as far as we thought they did. So to have them talk to each other genetically is, 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 is probably more of a challenge than we thought so. So these are, these are the things we're reevaluating now in a big way. Is, is can we realistically reach these goals? And just to demonstrate that, this is now that looking at focus areas in Connecticut, um, the gray areas, we've kind of written these off. We, the, the, and, and this, I know it's a real busy slide, but the diamonds, all those diamonds are Eastern cottontails that you can see are ubiquitous throughout the state. Any place you've got rabbitat, you're most likely gonna find Eastern cottontails. Um, and the, the circles are New England's of diff, diff, and the different, they're different dates that, that because that, that's why they're different colors. Mm -hmm. But um, I just wanted to show you that, that we don't think we've got 
New England's at all anymore here or what, here these what great town, what, what towns are they I can't see on the map oh, okay Lebanon Lebanon Basra Franklin okay that was this is our Lebanon focus area right. um Canterbury Plainfield this was part of a focus area um that that we, we we've been looking and it's somebody well I'll get to that in a sec you can see we have a lot of dots over here. We got a lot of diamonds over here. So we've been looking. It's not like we haven't been looking sure. here. So these gray areas, what we've seen is, is that flip to Eastern Cottontail. The purple areas are areas that we, um, we don't really know. We don't have a lot of data. So we have spent a lot of this winter looking in those areas to see if we do in fact have, have New England's there. Um, and the rest, the, 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 the green, red, and yellow are kind of color-coded um, to it, 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 as what you might expect. Green is good. You know, we, these are areas that we think we're, we're holding our own out there. We're not worried about these populations. Purple is where we need to collect more data. Red is concern. We've, we're, 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 those populations we haven't been seeing in the last few years. And um, yellow is is okay, you know. It, it looks like we're doing okay in those areas. So that's that's it. So here's my contact. If, oh, if um, yeah, if if uh, anybody buddy's interested, and uh, some other folks who still work on the program, 